Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. Whoever you are, wherever you find yourself, however you found us, and whatever time it is as you are part of this today, we are so glad to spend this time worshiping with you today. A couple of announcements before we begin our time together. These are actually thank yous. We want to say thank you to all the people who helped make and deliver our Silver Wing Suppers to the many Silver members of our congregation early last week. And also a huge thank you to all the wonderful volunteers, the angels who helped with our Shunga Trail cleanup project yesterday in honor of the late Dr. Bob Jacoby. All of these loving acts of service make the love of God very real in our world, and we are very grateful. Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Lord of all, let us open our mouths in praise that we may bear fruit in every season and be satisfied by your goodness. You are the source of all growth. Your grace abounds forever. Amen.
The scriptures are full of stories, men who grieved, women who questioned, siblings who did not get along, parents who chose favorites. God's word of grace is meant for all people. Let us pray. God of life, Lord of mercy, we confess that like Esau and Jacob, we selfishly make decisions that do not honor you or others. Believing ourselves wise, we foolishly follow our own way, falling short of your glory. Our pride keeps us from being honest about ourselves, our sin, and our needs. Forgive us as we pray and grant us the gift of your healing grace. Restore again both the joy of knowing you and the freedom of being known by you. Make us new and lead us in the way of life everlasting. The good news in Christ is that God offers us life at every moment, forgiving us and inviting us to the freshness of new beginnings. Amen. Good morning, young disciples. It's great to be with you in church this morning. Even if we can't be sitting right beside each other, the Holy Spirit brings us all together as a group anyway. I'm going to show you a picture today. This is a picture of my twin brother. Can you see that we look so much alike? Hmm? Yeah, we don't look alike at all, do we? He has really gray hair and he has a lot more hair than I have. My hair's dark, but I don't have as much. And, you know, even though we're twins, we couldn't be any more different. He's very outgoing. He'll go to a party and in five minutes he will have met everybody that is at the party. And they will know him by name. His name is Mike, by the way. And I'm kind of the opposite. I don't like to run around at a party. I like to stand over in the corner and have everybody else come over to me and introduce themselves. So we're just very different individuals, even though we were born at the same time on the same day. And you know, having a twin brother is very unique because there's this competition that goes on between the two of you. Growing up, my brother Mike and I were always competing with each other to see who could get the biggest piece of chocolate cake, to see who could hit the baseball further than the other person. And a lot of times that competition caused us to argue and fight with one another. We would get into some really knock down, drag out fights and argue and fuss and fight. Now that we're older, I realize how much I love my brother and he realizes how much he loves me. And we just love to be able to get together and share stories, even of those days when we were arguing and fussing and fighting with one another. Today in the scripture, you're gonna hear a story about Jacob and Esau who were twin brothers, and they fought a lot like that and, uh, with each other as well. And then as they grew up, they came to realize that they too had this bond as brothers and as twins, and that they had this love for one another. So be sure and listen to that story and Sandra's special message about that, okay? Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for family especially for brothers and even twin brothers, even though we may argue and fuss and fight. At the end of the day, we realize that we love one another. And thank you for families that love us and care for us. Be with us and guide us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Please listen to the prayer of illumination. Life-giving God, we praise you for the gift of your word, for the light and life it brings to our lives. Through it, we come to know you better and understand ourselves more fully. We find the wisdom and encouragement we need to live as your faithful disciples. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. 
There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Our second scripture reading this morning is Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 through 34. Hear the word of the Lord. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is a scene from the popular Netflix series, The Crown, which follows the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. This is from season three, episode two, and it is a flashback to a moment when the young Princess Elizabeth is beginning her training to become queen, and she is told, the crown is not just an ornament to be worn, but a privilege and a burden which comes with formidable expectations and responsibilities. Then it shows her sitting on her bed and saying to her younger sister, Margaret, I don't think I could do it. I could, says Margaret. I know you could, says Elizabeth. Margaret says, I'd love every minute to be on every coin and every banknote, to be the most famous woman in the world. I'd be so very good at it, wearing a big crown, giving everyone orders. Yes, says Elizabeth. Margaret says, tell them Margaret Rose can do it. Margaret Rose wants to do it. Margaret Rose was born to do it. You were, says Elizabeth. Then let me speak to them about it in the morning, says Margaret. All right, says Elizabeth. We watch this scene knowing full well that nothing either sister can say will change the fact that Elizabeth is the oldest, so Elizabeth will become queen. Even if, as Margaret's husband says many years later, Margaret is a natural number one whose tragedy it is to be born number two. For thousands of years, ever since there have been people and families, the oldest child has certain rights and responsibilities. 
even if, like Esau and Jacob, the oldest is born with the younger one right on his heels because it's all about who arrives first. In today's story, when Rebecca feels her boys struggling together in her womb, she receives the astonishing prophecy that the elder shall serve the younger. We don't know if she ever bothered to share this information with Isaac, who clearly prefers his oldest son, but what's really astonishing is what Jacob does to his brother Esau. Esau comes in from the field and he is hungry. And you know, we don't always think clearly when we are hungry. I remember a time, I think I've shared this story before when I was pregnant with my daughter Madeline and I was in that second trimester when you are hungry and you need to eat. And one evening I was waiting for Madeline's dad to come home from work with dinner and he was supposed to bring home a pizza. So the time came when I was expecting him to be home and he still wasn't home yet and I was starting to get impatient and at last his car pulled up in the driveway. Finally, he was home with that pizza. Well, I heard him get out of the car, but he didn't come inside. And he didn't come inside and he didn't come inside and I thought, what in the world? How dare he keep me waiting like this? What is he thinking? Eventually he came inside and I said, where were you? What took you so long? And he replied, bless his heart. I was getting the cat down off the roof. And all I could think of was how easy it would have been to have brought the pizza inside to me first and then worry about the cat. So I replied in all my hungry hormonal glory, don't you ever speak to me again. And in the interaction between Esau and Jacob, we see how hunger affects Esau. Sure, sure, take my birthright, just give me some dinner. And when I read about the encounter between the two brothers, I keep picturing the children in that famous marshmallow test from the 1970s when researchers give each child one marshmallow but promise them a second one if they can hang on 15 more minutes without eating the first one. And I picture Esau as the kid who gobbles what's in front of him in the moment and Jacob as the more strategic kid who craves more and is determined to have more and is prepared to wait if that's what it takes. But perhaps another reason that Esau treats his birthright so lightly is because deep down he knows he can't give it away any more than Elizabeth could give the crown to her younger sister. Can you just imagine Esau going to his parents and saying, yeah, um, Jacob and I did this thing and he's gonna be the firstborn now and I'll be number two. Think Isaac's gonna go along with that? As we'll learn next week, that is not exactly how it plays out. The unsavory character in this story is Jacob, who takes advantage of someone who is hungry in order to get what he wants. He's like a predatory lender. He's like a coyote, one of those guys that preys on people who are desperate to get into the United States and charges them a crazy amount of money to smuggle them over the border. Remember in the first sermon in this series when I talked about the book, Where Did I Come From? I said that we might discover some things in our spiritual ancestry that make us go, ew, and I think this is one of them. But the real scandal in this story isn't Esau or Jacob or even Isaac and Rebecca who play favorites with their kids. The real scandal in this story is God. Because God does not play by human rules and expectations. God does not choose the firstborn son to be the son through whom God keeps the promise to Abraham to bless him and multiply his descendants 
and make him a great nation through which all the other nations of the world shall be blessed. God chooses the scheming, grasping younger brother instead. Now, God does not abandon Esau any more than God abandoned Ishmael, the firstborn of Abraham. And God does indeed make Esau into his own nation, just as God had pr promised Rebekah. But it's through Jacob that God will keep the covenant. And like the young Princess Elizabeth, Jacob will learn that his new role comes with formidable expectations and responsibilities, probably even more than he bargained for. The deeper message of this story, however, isn't so much about birth order as it is about privilege. Being the oldest matters because of the privilege that comes with it. In our world, the one who gets there first gets the best deal. Whether we're the first ones born, the first ones to arrive to a new land, the first ones in line in the buffet, or the first ones to get through the door of Walmart on Black Friday. You can't tell me it's not fun to be first. Don't you love it when you go to the grocery store and you are waiting in line to check out with a cart full of stuff and there's a couple other people in front of you and they have carts full of stuff and then all of a sudden a checker waves and says, I can take you over here on number six. And because the two people in front of you are kind of trapped, you, who thought you would have to wait, get to go right on over and start unloading your stuff. And you feel a tiny twinge of guilt, maybe, because after all, the people ahead of you have been waiting longer, but you've just been offered a chance to be first, and you're gonna take it. On the other hand, don't you hate it? when you're in a restaurant and you've placed your order and you've waited and waited and then you see a table over there that came in 10 minutes after you and already they've got their food while you're still waiting and you wanna say, hey, I was here first. One of the clearest messages of the Bible is that God really has very little regard for who was there first. What did Jesus say in that super annoying parable about the workers in the vineyard when the workers who work for an hour get paid the same amount as the workers who are there all day? And not only that, but they get paid first. Many who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. God is going to do what God is going to do, and it will not always match human ideas of what is fair, or appropriate. Thank goodness, since God's ideas of justice are always bigger and better than ours. The important thing is to remember where all of this drama is ultimately headed, which is that all the peoples of the world shall be blessed. And there is more than enough blessing to go around though Isaac and his family cannot see that yet. So if you are someone who struggles with constantly feeling like a number two in a world where number ones get the glory, good news, God loves number twos and you are fully included in the promise. And if you are someone who is accustomed to being number one and you have felt anxious lately because your place in the world doesn't feel as solid as it used to and your views on things are not shared and respected like they used to be and it feels like you don't shine and sparkle quite as brightly as you used to, good news, you can let that go. It is okay not to be first all the time. 
it is liberating not to have to be first all the time. And if the first shall be last and the last shall be first, don't we eventually get to, play, to a place where we can't tell who's first and who's last anyway? And even if we could, it wouldn't matter for all are one in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. We offer ourselves with our gifts, confident that God has a purpose for them and for us until it is safe to gather here and worship together. You may still mail your donation by check to the church office, or you can also donate online by going to donate.fpctopeka.org. Let us pray. Giver of life, thank you for all the blessings you have poured into our lives, even in the midst of these challenging times. Receive these gifts, that they may become seeds of hope and love. Amen. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we are members of a royal priesthood bound together by the Holy Spirit. Let us now intercede on behalf of the world, we pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for the angels watching over us. We give you thanks that no matter where we go, you know our name. We give you thanks for being in our midst for being the ground on which we walk and the air that we breathe. We give you thanks for showing us a still more excellent way in love. Above all, Lord, we give you thanks for your grace, infinitely abounding and always renewing. As we sit in quietness, our thoughts are far from quiet. While fading smiles, Leave us, we wrestle with doubts and fears. We seek answers. We are hoping against hope. We are seeking strength with a faith that wavers. But we have not lost our faith and we still believe you are present with us. Your word says the hungry will be filled. And we ask today for you to fill us, fill us with the breath of life. Fill us with thankful hearts. Fill us with calmness, courage, and most of all, with the knowledge of your presence. 
There are others we know and love who are ill, and we ask, O oh God, that you would surround them with your strong healing presence. Grant wisdom to those who need answers to difficult questions. Give hope to those who despair and friendship to those who feel lonely. Most of all, O oh Lord, may we know the great love you have for each one of us. You were there at our beginning and you will be with us through the end. May we always be mindful of your constant care. We look to you, O oh God, to be close at hand. Continue to show us how we at First Presbyterian can be part of your work in this world. Teach us how we can grow into faith and become more and more like Jesus. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless the work of our hands. Bless all that we offer today. We pray for this church as we seek to be faithful to your calling to bring good news to all people. We pray that in this ministry, you will bless us richly to your service. And now we gather together all our prayers, the spoken and the unspoken, and place them at your feet, waiting and knowing that you are a God of grace and goodness, and that you hear and answer our prayers. These things we pray in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today, O oh God, we have turned to you in search of direction for our lives, and you did not turn us away. You have opened our ears to your word, our eyes to your purpose, and our hearts to your presence. Now send us forth as people who hear with their ears, see with their eyes, and understand with their hearts that your word might bear fruit within us and through us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.